Hi everyone, this is our channel, Meet the Real Story. Please, like, share and subscribe. I have drank and I've used drugs, but I've never suffered from withdrawals. I've never chosen drugs or alcohol over my loved ones. And I have never stolen anything in order to score. I'm not an addict, but I love one. And sometimes that's an addiction. Like so many other teens and young adults, I experimented with my fair share of recreational drugs and alcohol in high school. So when my younger sister started doing the same thing when she was 14, I wrote off her new habits as reckless, youthful behavior. She would grow out of this phase eventually, I thought, just like I did. But instead of getting worried with the lifestyle and moving on, she craved more of it, and by the time she was 19, the party drugs she was using were not even enough for her. And that's when she found heroin. One of the first things that gave away her addiction was her eyes, usually big and blue and full of light. They became dark and dodgy orbs that could never quite focus, never look you back, never hold your gaze. The look I had once found in them was long gone, and I felt uneasy whenever our eyes met, which, as she began to use more, became less and less frequent. As drugs became a bigger part of her life, everything else became smaller, even me. The days of us driving around our small town in my car, smoking a ball and blasting sublime, were replaced with quick visits to her darkened bedroom, a space that I had left her in after I went off to college, which had transformed from a teenage safe heaven into a dark cave filled with cigarette smoke, empty booze bottles, and stash boxes of every kind of opiate you could imagine, including heroin, oxycodone, and opium. The evidence was right in front of me, but sometimes it's easier to ignore the obvious than it is to embrace the uncomfortable. When we went out, which was rare because it was nearly impossible to get my sister away from the comfort cave she had built for herself, I wrote off her frequent visits to the bathroom and lack of appetite as stomach problems or even body issues. When she didn't laugh at our favorite comedy sketches, I told myself that maybe she'd just seen it too many times for it to be funny anymore. When she stayed up until 4 a.m. in the morning and slept until 3 p.m., and when she started wearing long clothes in 90 degree weather, when she couldn't hold a job, when she got her hands on money she couldn't explain, and when I actually found her stash in her purse when I was snooping one day, I just kept telling myself, she's young, she's rebelling, she'll move past this phase. I was 24 and living in Brooklyn, when my 21-year-old sister called me and admitted it. Plainly and almost optimistically, she was an addict. I think you already know this, she said, voice shaky in a little too loud. But I have a drug problem. Her confession gave me no choice but to admit it too. And suddenly, my entire world had changed. The lying, the stealing, the cheating, the messy parts of an addict's life don't really change from one user to the next. They're just as dark, just as sad, and just as unforgivable as you would imagine they would be. And they're not worth the reliving and writing because I relive them every day in my own mind. Loving a drug addict is all-consuming and inescapable. It's on your mind all the time. You become a husk of a human whose insights have been entirely replaced by anger, fear, and resentment, and suddenly those feelings start to bubble over into every part of your life. The little voices in your head start to tell you to be suspicious of everyone in your life. Because if this one person could betray you, if your loved one could steal from you, 
if your own little sister could stare you straight in the eyes and swear up and down they haven't used, when you know damn well they're hiding the drugs in their bra, then who can you trust? Your constant suspicion makes you angry too. Angry at your loved one for getting addicted in the first place. Furious at the family who sat back and watched it happen. And bitter with the entire world for allowing a problem like this to exist. But it's the guilt that hurts me most of all. Because I have taken her addiction and made it my own. Because of the darkest question in my mind isn't about whether or not my sister will live to her 25th birthday, but rather how I could have prevented it all by her 15th birthday. We grew up in a small town, and my sister and I, we were three years apart, were close in as preteens and as teens. We did all the normal things sisters do together. Shopping, movie nights, annoying our mother. But we also did the normal things bored kids from a small town do together. And that included drinking, drugs, and partying. By the time I was a senior in high school and she was a freshman, we skipped out on the first period of school in favor of a ball cruise and a late breakfast at the diner in the next town over. When I went off to college, I didn't leave my sister at home to die of boredom. Instead, I frequently had her come visit me. And we would attend frat parties, go to raves, and stay up all night drinking, smoking, and doing whatever drug of choice. Weed, moly, ecstasy, and poppers of every variety was being passed around that night. When I would return, Home for visits, I made sure I always came packing weed for out west. A 30 rack of beer from the liquor store and a small bag of the latest pill or powder to make the rounds at campus. And it didn't stop after college either. When I moved to New York for my first post-grad job, my sister came out to spend the Thanksgiving holiday with me. And instead of watching the Macy's Day Parade like we did when we were kids, we tripped on synthetic acid and made weed cookies. Even though I've traded in my own days of hard partying for a life of Friday nights spent curled up on the couch with a glass of glass, it's hard not to wonder if my influence on my sister's life led her down this dark and unending spiral of addiction. How could I have let something this awful happen to someone I love? And what role did I play in causing this? Those constant feelings of guilt are as consuming as heroin itself. Loving an addict is like being a user yourself. Only instead of injecting your body with the pills and powders and alcohol, you soak your entire life in remorse and self-condemnation. You convince yourself that you caused the problem and not the addict. That you're somehow in the way of the solution, not the addiction. It's selfish and self-absorbed to assume you have so much power over someone else's life and something as strong as drug addiction. But when you love someone who is struggling, you just want to take everything difficult away from them, including the responsibility. And I find comfort in my guilt because I feel like as long as I own it and claim responsibility for it, I can own my sister's addiction too. If I own it, then I can control it. And if I can control it, then I can solve it. If I can solve it, then I can make sure it never happens again. But my safety blanket of guilt is more than just a desperate grasp at control. It's an addiction that feeds my soul in a vital and necessary way. A direct connection to a sister I'm constantly worried about losing. If my addiction is alive, if my guilt survives in a way, my sister will always survive too. They teach you in support groups not to blame yourself, not to hold yourself accountable for someone else's choices, but for me... Letting go of that guilt is an impossible task. In my head, I know my sister's addiction is not my fault. 
I know I did not create my sister's addiction, but deep in the pit of my stomach, I feel these things. And unless you're the loved one of an addict, it's impossible to understand the need for both of those irrational beliefs to be true. I want to be the one in charge of my sister's addiction, because that means I have control over it. And that means I can make it go away just like I made it happen. But that's not how addiction works. No amount of wishing or hoping or praying or even loving can make it go away. We think of love as this powerful force in our lives, something that comforts us and keeps us safe and warm. But I have seen its ugly head. I've seen how destructive it can be, how painful it can feel, and how deceptive it really is. What I thought could be an all-powerful weapon capable of cutting through even the thickest chains of addiction actually became a heavy set of shackles. But I began to cling to that love anyway, because I believed that if I just loved my sister hard enough, I could make her problems go away. My sister doesn't live with my family anymore. After getting clean, falling off the wagon, and repeating the cycle a few times, she decided that the best thing for her was to get on a plane and fly halfway around the world to Abu Dhabi where she lives in a mostly drug-free country teaching preschool. She needed time and space to get away from her addiction. But no matter where in the world she runs to, my addiction to her won't be far behind. My sister has her own demons to fight, her own addictions that she will struggle with her whole life. But so do I. I am addicted to fixing her, addicted to keeping her safe. And it's hard to see where one of our addictions starts and the other one ends. I don't know if my sister has kicked her heroin addiction for now, or if she's kicked it for good. But I don't know if I will ever be able to stop worrying about it. However, there's one thing that I know. I love my sister, and that's a habit I will never be able to kick. Hi, I am Ralph. I am 19 years old. I have simple secret that I like my mother. Don't judge me, just listen to my story. I had a quiet family, kind mother and loving father. We had stable lives in our far state. But as you know, there is no place for happy life in our world. There was a turning point in life and it came quickly with me. It was a nice day in our garden, me, my mother and my father. My father was sitting under a tree reading a book. Me and my mother were playing football. Suddenly, mom overshot and the ball went into the street. I was too young to think. I just ran quickly to pick the ball. There was a fast car. The driver was screaming at me, stay away, but I did not. My mother sacrificed herself to rescue me. I fainted and when I woke up, I saw my mother's blood everywhere. My father was crying. There were a lot of people. Our lives changed to be gloomy. He was surrounding me by many looks. I thought he blamed me because of her death. He was so sad. I left my friends. I did not talk with people. I was just eight years old. I was thinking of killing myself. I would like to escape from this blame. Suddenly, my father decided to marry. I shocked because I could not imagine any other woman instead of my mother at home. He said in a firm voice, She will be at home soon. He asked me to be a good boy. I entered my room and started crying. I could not imagine. But I decided to annoy her. When she prepared food, I immediately threw it. Her only reaction was a kind smile. While my father was staying at home, I insisted by bothering her by doing a lot of noisy things. My father was shouting and she always protected me. I said to myself, maybe she is a good woman, and she loves me. One time, while she was cooking, she had a phone call from the hospital. It was an urgent matter. I was watching TV. She came in to me and said, Ralph, my sister is in the hospital and I have to go. Can you take care of cooking? I did not care. She smiled and went out. I went to the kitchen and turned up the heat to burn the food. But the fire did not just burn the food. 
it started to burn home too. There was fire everywhere. I could not breathe. Then I fainted. I woke up, but I did not know where am I. I looked around and saw my stepmother sleeping. She looked exhausted, and there was cinder on her face. Suddenly the door opened and I discovered that I was in the hospital. The nurse said, get well soon. I asked her what happened. She told me that there was a big fire at our home, and my mother is a brave woman. She entered home and rescued me in the last moment. I looked at her, I discovered that she is a great woman. She woke up suddenly and asked me, are you okay? I hugged her and cried. I said, sorry for everything. She said, it is okay. I can understand. I considered her my mother. I started to help her in everything at home. She helped me a lot. I supported her a lot until her last illness. Today, I'm standing in her gravesite. I want to tell her that I love her a lot.